Welcome to the Sustainable Production Forum. Hath squile, each tenoyap, toits tenat quien quenchamen, cease quien sna, on hath in squalowin, on wanoxed in squalowin titsis. Welcome everybody. It lifts my heart to welcome you to these ancestral lands and waters of the Huamathquiam, the Tesleiwatuth, and the Skolmish Old Olkameo. I am Skolmish and Stalo, and I'm standing on these shorelines where the salt water meets the shoreline and, and comes back into the forest with ancient trees, ancient cedar trees, ancient fir trees, and ancient maples. Welcome, Osiem. It's our job at CBC Radio-Canada to report on what we, as Canadians, care about. Politics, culture, sports, entertainment. But there's a bigger picture, something Canadians care about even more, the environment. It's what all the rest of it hinges on. We wouldn't be here without forests, wildlife, and oceans. Stories on the environment often have a way of making us feel powerless and small. Who are we against a hurricane? Who are we against a wildfire? Who are we against a changing climate? We are more powerful than it seems. So we're not just going to report on the environment. We're going to take action and help preserve all the things we care about. We've looked at how we can do better and set some goals for 2026. And that's just the beginning. Our ultimate goal is carbon neutral. As we move towards zero, we will report on our progress. Keeping you informed is our job, after all. Ontario's film and television industry is committed to a sustainable future. The Ontario Green Screen Initiative is a public-private partnership of industry leaders that have assembled to provide the tools, relationships, resources, and educational opportunities required to make real environmental change. Visit OntarioGreenScreen.ca for more information about how you can take part. Welcome to SPF 22. I'm Zena Harris, president of GreenSpark Group and creative director of the Sustainable Production Forum. Hi, I'm Melanie Windle, executive producer of the Sustainable Production Forum. Thank you for being here with us. I'd like to thank Cease Weiss for that wonderful traditional welcome. I'm tuning in from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, and Pakani, the Sutna Nation, the Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. 
Today, I'm tuning in from the traditional territories of the Puyallup and Coast Salish peoples of the Puget Sound area. This virtual event is coming to you from around the globe. And if you are unsure of whose traditional land you are watching us from, you can visit native-land.ca or indigenousworld.org to learn more. Those links should be popping up in the chat shortly. Please share with us in the chat where you are tuning in from. We are so excited to welcome you back to the seventh annual Sustainable Production Forum. It's a delight to gather again. For the better part of 2022, Zena and I have been discussing your pain points, your successes, and figuring out how we can have an impact and move the needle in decarbonization in our sector. We have been meeting with leaders, experts, change makers, and disruptors for the last six weeks, having incredible conversations, and we are excited to share them with you throughout the month of October. If you have occasion to be in Vancouver, Toronto, or New York City, don't forget to check out our in-person events. Please introduce yourself. We love seeing the community grow. Something special about SPF is that it is a gathering place for stakeholders across the entertainment industry. And we are very grateful for the support, collaboration, and allyship we have developed with our partners. The SPF 22 lead partners are Presenting partner, Real Green, Creative BC, Motion Picture Production Industry Association. Platinum partner, MBS Canada. Signature partners, CBC Radio Canada and Telefilm Canada. Please visit our website or check out our sponsor page on the event platform to get to know all our partners and vendors. A bit of housekeeping. Please take an opportunity to engage with the community board to post or take our polls during sessions. Say hello to our partners and vendors. Please help us gather important measuring points by participating. Join the social media conversation by using the hashtag SPF22. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for A Global Search for Optimism, presented by program partner, Cream Productions. Humans have come so far in so little time. And in this lively moderated panel, we discuss what it means to tell hopeful climate stories, exciting progress in the push for electric vehicles, and how to make a global production as climate friendly as possible. Joining us today are Catherine Liptrot, Cream Production Series Producer, Lucy Mugala, Product Engineer and Team Lead, Rome Electric Vehicles, Mark Stevenson, Cream Production Series Director and Environmental Journalist, and Albin Wilson, Chief Strategy and Marketing Officer, Rome Electric Vehicles. And leading this wonderful conversation is Angelica Siegel, Sustainability Communications Manager, Cream Productions. Thank you everyone for joining us today on this panel. We're really excited to be here. To warm us up, let's get started with introductions, share your role, where you're calling from today, and a little bit about how your work intersects with climate and sustainable production. Mark, let's uh, start with you. Yeah, hi there, I'm Mark Stevenson, and I'm calling in from Dundas, Ontario, which is outside of uh, Hamilton and about an hour from Toronto. Uh, I'm a producer, director, freelance. I've uh, been doing that uh, on and off for uh, more than 25 years. Uh, I hate to date myself, but it's true. Uh, I'm currently the director on a series with Cream Productions that's related to the environment. Uh, that's very excited. That's very exciting. And uh, hopefully we can tell you a little bit about that without going into too many details. Um, I've been covering the environment uh, on and off, like I said, since I started out 25 years ago as an intern at CNN, um, where it was my job with the other interns to put together the climate change handbook uh, for CNN. And here we are 25 years later, uh, still talking about the environment. I specialize in history and science and occasionally uh, and frequently that intersects with the environment. 
Great, thank you. Uh, Albin? Yes, I'm calling in from Nairobi, Kenya, and um, I work at Rome, which is an electric vehicle startup here in Kenya. We develop mass transit vehicles, so buses and motorcycles that are locally adapted for the environment, and my background in engineering. And uh, I think, you know, it's obvious that we need clean transportation and clean energy production, and we're trying to make that happen here. Great, thank you. Lucy. Hi everyone, my name is Lucy, um, calling in from Nairobi, Kenya. So I'm a product engineer um, at Rome. I, I have a background in mechatronics engineering and um, I love that I get to use my, you know, my knowledge and um, scientific uh, principles to just build on projects that save on the, save on the planet. Um, so I focus on uh, electric motorcycle um, design and development. Um, so I think this is my focus, my core focus is usually battery technology. And I love that particular field because it, this is what we are replacing the fossil fuel with, with the battery. Um, so we are targeting, you know, reducing the carbon footprint um, by managing vehicle emissions, um, so deploying electric vehicles in mass um, across the country, across the continent. And I feel very privileged to be part of such a huge movement. Personally, I'm very big on sustainability. I've done several projects prior to joining Rome that um, address different various issues um, environmentally. So uh, a, a good example was um, a circular economy project that I did for um, reducing waste in transportation of plastics, um, plastic bottles to be precise. So my personal goals um, really tie in well with the current work that I do now. And I feel very, very privileged to be part of this yeah. space. Um, I've currently, I've been working here for three years um, now. And all I can say is um, I'm very, very excited about, you know, deploying electric motorcycles, electric buses, creating awareness around that, and overall just building a better planet for our future generations. Yeah. We're so excited to dive into some of the details around what Rome does, uh, and that'll move us into the next set of questions. But we'll we'll go to Catherine for a quick intro, and and then we'll get started. Hi, I'm Catherine Lettrod. I'm the series producer working with Mark John, uh, with Mark Stevenson at uh, Cream. Um, and our series is around sustainability and also the theory that if, if we got ourselves into this predicament, we can probably invent and think our way out of it. Um, and those are the stories that we're hoping uh, to highlight in the series, uh, which, is, which is why when we found Rome, we were so excited and reached out to them about being in the series. Um, uh, I have a background in documentary, specifically um, uh, in natural history. Um, and so if you spend enough time making natural history films, you learn that the planet is in more trouble than we think. Um, uh, but yeah, I make documentaries and we're super excited about this new series because as I say, um, what we really want to talk about in this series is how we can get out of the situation that we've gotten ourselves into. Um, and there are some really exciting projects around the world that, uh, that we're thrilled to be able to bring to TV. Excellent. Very excited about the series. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into that as we go. We're going to start some of our questions uh, with Albin and Lucy. Uh, we're so excited, as Catherine said, to have Rome here on the panel. As you've probably gathered, Rome produces electric vehicles in Kenya with a vision to become the standard for electric mobility in Africa. And um, we're excited to learn more about your products, more about how you're bringing electric vehicles to market and how we can apply some of those learnings to the film and production world where of course electric vehicles is a big conversation and a really big barrier still. So very excited what we can learn from you both today. Um, we'll get started with our first question. This will be for Lucy. 
Maybe you can tell us briefly about Rome's core electric vehicle products. And um, after Lucy Albin, if you want to jump in and add anything, please feel free. The Rome's core products, um, as Albin had mentioned, are targeting the mass transit um, industry. Um, and this is because this is the largest segment in our country at the moment. Um, so this, this means we'll, we will have a huge impact um, doing away with, you know, all these um, fossil fuel buses and, and, and motorcycles that are, you know, growing in number every day, um, doubling every year. Um, you know, this means the carbon footprint is growing um, quite rapidly in Kenya and in Africa at large. So we want to maximize our impact as much as possible by targeting this particular segment. Now, um, currently we, uh, we are rolling out, or rather we've actually deployed quite a number of um, electric motorcycles so far. So we've done a lot of piloting, a lot of testing, a lot of feasibility studies, um, and now we are ready to scale up and commercialize our product. Um, at the same time, we are now rolling out um, electric buses. Um, it's been quite an interesting journey, um, creating awareness around that, doing a lot of tests, uh, mapping out routes, um, just so that we can um, sort of, you know, penetrate the market, you know, easily um, with this new technology. You know, we, we have to create awareness first. We have to do a lot of tests, a lot of trials. Um, but essentially, our I think our strategy is um, making the making the electric vehicles accessible, making them reliable, making them cost effective. This is so that we can make people want to buy our product. They need to see that these products are available, these products are affordable, and so it makes it makes the transition from fossil fuel vehicles easier. Um, and you know, we've also done a lot of work building capacity locally in terms of design, in terms of manufacturing and production. Um, and in that way, people here are able to relate to the product because this product is made for them by people like them, you know? Um, so they feel this is a familiar product. This is tailored for the market. We have made, we have custom made our product for this market specifically um, because as you know it's not the easiest market to penetrate however it's the fastest growing um, economy at the moment we have a lot of um, capacity here we have a lot of technical know-how we have a lot of skills and resources to make this work um, and so we are calling on and working together with so many partners government stakeholders um, the users themselves, the people themselves, making sure that we're building a product that is for them, as well as working with government bodies to standardize the product, reduce costs, um, cutting down um, the cost of production by you know, ensuring that more than 30% of the components that go into our product are locally manufactured. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're creating jobs at the same time. So I'd say our, our strategy is to tell a story through our products, that this is for you, built for you, it's accessible, it's affordable, it saves the planet. And this is, we have to speak a language that they understand. If we talk to these people and we, for example, uh, a rider right now of a, of a motorcycle might not really understand what a lithium battery is. So lithium batteries are the technology that we use in our battery packs. They wouldn't understand what that means. But we need to tell them that this motorcycle, for example, is going to save you, you know, running costs. It's going to save you the cost of fuel. The cost of fuel is rising every day. Um, as you all know, it's a global issue. So telling the story in a way that they understand makes it easier for them to want to buy the product and slowly by slowly they get to understand what this means for the climate in the long run which is mm -hmm. our core vision and our core goal yeah so our strategy is to basically just tell the story tell a story through our products and then eventually we are going to have that impact that we are so passionate about which is saving the planet electrifying africa basically love it very exciting stuff thank you so much Albin, do you have anything to add there? No, I think, you know, 
as Lu, Lu, Lucy obviously points out uh, the majority of the points that we have and I think to add on is that we not only try to have sustainability throughout our products but also throughout our company and that's not just environmental sustainability we're trying to do it through you know reasonable um, vacation days um, maternity leave and paternity leave um, currently we also you know employ 40 percent women in, across all fields um, so I think you know it's about trying to have sustainability across the board rather than just in one core um, aspect. And I think the production industry has the same kind of, you know, challenge to try to adapt sustainability in, in many different aspects, not just in, you know, transport to and from sets, but how do you, you know, create, you know, circular sustainable systems. Yeah. There's so many different categories uh, in the film world to tackle. Transport, of course, is a big one, but you're right. There are many different angles to take when it comes to sustainability. And um, it's also, of course, as you mentioned, tied to equality and equity and, um, you know, ethical, ethical companies and treating people fairly and treating people well. So uh, really great. And uh, uh, Rome is a joint company, a Kenyan Swedish company. Albin, has that had any influence on um, some of these practices? How have the two countries sort of collaborated to, to create the mission and the mandate of Rome? I think it's interesting to see, you know, you, you, you bring different aspects from different cultures. And um, what that kind of does is that, you know, you have to question everything from the ground up from first principle to a certain degree, right? And, you know, why do we do things like we do them, you know, when we're in Kenya or being Swedish in Kenya um, and just trying to take the best from both worlds. Because, you know, you've seen Europe has kind of slowed down on innovation, slow down on will to thrive, to reinvent itself while Kenya is on the rise and has that extreme power and passion for change uh, and moving forward. So I think, you know, that is, is really powerful to mesh them together. And, and to add on to, to that, Alvin, I feel like it's, it's such a beautiful space to be in because it, it reminds you that everyone has a role to play in making the world a better place, regardless of your culture, your gender your you know social background it doesn't matter we all have something to bring to the table and we all have so many ideas to you know exchange and collaborate and just build a better world together so i feel like that is the, my my biggest takeout in working with within a company that is as inclusive um as rome in every way and it it, it just sends a message out there that everyone has a role to play. And it's not just, you know, a male field or, uh, you know, a, a first world problem or a third world problem. It's for everybody to come together and bring in your resources. Whatever you have um, to chip in is enough for us to make a better place, um, you know, a better world for future generations. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe you can tell us a little more about this innovative, um, kind of forward-facing uh, energy that's in Kenya right now and how electric vehicles are a natural fit for that and, and how that kind of can take us into the future in, in Kenya's future. Alvin, do you want to start us off with that one? Aha, uh -huh. yes, of course. Um, <laughs> no, I think, you know, the, the thing is, um, as Lucy mentioned, is that, you know, Kenya and, and the region as a whole is, is a rapidly growing and with a really quick urbanization right and what we've seen in kenya before is this adoption of new technologies quite rapidly um you know we've seen adoption of um mobile payment in 2006 um i mean before even anyone thought about venmo or transferring money anyhow through anything kenya was transferring money through text message cashless right um, and I mean, I'm sitting here in, in Nairobi, but if I take the train to the coast, I can tell you the 4G network is a lot better than it is in Sweden. Um, and that's because nobody laid, laid down landlines instead, right? You know, so it's, 
it's this leapfrogging uh, technologies. And what I think we think will happen is um, that, you know, we don't start with fossil fuel vehicle production here locally. We will start with, you know, the thing that makes sense now. And that's electric vehicles combined with, you know, renewable energy production. Mm -hmm. That all sounds great. And, and it, certainly innovation plays a huge role in pushing this forward. Um, also on sort of a, a systems level. So getting electric vehicles to market is also a conversation that has to be had with, you know, of course, private companies, the public sector, the municipality. How have you approached getting these products to market and kind of getting it through all of those levels of of checks and balances and, and getting everybody on board for this vision. If I could just jump in, um, I, I feel like our our um, government in general, I think we there's, there's so many incentives um, that drive the adoption of e-mobility. Um, there's enough awareness and there's a growing awareness um, for the need to shift to a greener economy and one of the ways we are tackling this is by incentivizing private sectors, any you know partners, to start taking up um, the adoption of electric vehicles. And you find that some of the stakeholders, like our you know electricity generating company and other players, are on the forefront of deploying you know charging infrastructure to just make the move smooth and easy. Um, there's also, of course, the fact that uh, Kenya, Kenya's renewable, I think we have a surplus of, of, of electricity in this country, which is something very few people know about. Um, and most of our, I think 90% of our grid is, is, is generated from renewable sources. So we have solar, we have, sorry, hydro, geothermal and wind covering 90% of the, you know, electricity generation in the country so we have enough already we have enough power on the grid to support electric vehicles so the transition won't be you know at least there's that support um there's also you know tax incentives on um renewable energy components be it you know solar systems um battery systems and things like that that make it easier to reduce the cost or the selling price of electric vehicles um, and of course, there's the overall global, or rather the long-term strategy that we have as a country to, you know, have 5% of all registered um, vehicles being electric by 2025. And basing on what the current number is, that's quite a big number. And that means everyone has to come together to build capacity and be able to meet this goal. Um, by deploying electric vehicles. There's a lot of support in that sense. Um, another thing is on the manufacturing of electric, of, of, of just generally the automation sector in Kenya, we are really having a big shift in building capacity and moving assembly and manufacturing locally because, you know, Kenya is not known as an automotive uh, manufacturing country, yeah? But with time, we are adopting structures and systems that support this. And, you know, our Ministry of Manufacturing is on the forefront to ensure that we are tapping into local talent, local resources, um, so providing support for us to be able to build as much as we can locally so that we can reduce costs of, you know, selling electric vehicles. And that makes it easier to also penetrate the market. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I feel there's a lot of support in that sense. Um, that's that's something I want to stay on, and I'm going to open up to Catherine and Mark now for some comments on how this, how we can sort of apply some of these comments to the film world. Um, when it comes to you know incentives and setting goals, these seem like some of the key mechanisms that Kenya is is doing to push EVs um, kind of further along in the market. I know you know, you might not be super involved in, in the electric vehicle world in the film industry, but 
in the industry itself, are there conversations that you're aware of around incentivizing electric vehicles or, or the market, the sort of the, the existing uh, vehicle market that a, a film company can tap into? Have you heard of any of this happening um, from your perspective? I'll just I'll I'll say one thing, and that is is that 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 and and, the, and I think it's you know just to give people context. There's a difference between there's a difference between what a documentary unit looks like and what a and what a feature film or a, or a drama unit looks mm -hmm. like, and our units are really small. What I find, um, and and I don't know any of incentives for for documentary filmmakers. Um, uh, I think that they're. But what I do find shocking is how hard it is to rent an electric vehicle, right? So because we travel all the time and, 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 and that's the other thing we are, the carbon footprint, you know, I would, I would love to see the difference between the carbon footprint of one individual working on a drama and one individual working on a doc, because I think most people would say, oh, well, the documentary people are so sustainable, except when you see where we fly, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, because we fly everywhere. But you can't rent an electric vehicle. I mean, it, it, there, are, there, are some, there are some places in Europe where you can, but certainly in North America, it's almost impossible. And I think, you know, I, I think that also, for instance, in Toronto speaks to, speaks to, to charging mm -hmm. stations and infrastructure, which we simply don't have, right? Like it's, 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 um, it's sometimes shocking to me. And, and what I think is really interesting about what Alvin said and, and this idea of, of, of leapfrogging, I remember being in Kenya and, and seeing someone use PESA, which is their, which is their mobile transfer system. And, and I was just like, what is that? And they were like, oh, well, somebody's sending me money. And I was like, what do you mean they're sending you money? On your phone? What is this, what is this magic, right? <laughs> and I mean, and then we find, you know, it finally showed up in North America, but I think, and, and so I think this idea of leapfrogging is really interesting and certainly, you know, in terms of vehicles and stuff, but, Sorry to get back to your question. It's just it's it's shocking to me that we don't have charging stations on the street in Toronto. Right, it's the largest city in Canada. There are no charging stations on the street. You can find one in the basement of a of a shopping center or something. But but in even in Montreal, they've taken out parking meters and they put in they put in charging stations. So I think, you know, for what we do, we yeah. need to be able to rent EVs. Um, certainly, you know, we look at where we stay and whether it's sustainable. We look at our own practices. Right, uh, just individually, how how the how the crew works together, and 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 how we try and be a bit more sustainable. Um, but for us, it's 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 vehicles, and and we just can't mm -hmm. we can't find them. We can't. Yeah, just, just to support support or add to what Catherine's saying, I think the conversations that are happening in the industry are happening in offices and on sets. Um, you know, where they film a movie, where they're doing recreations. Uh, that sort of thing. And, you know, that's more of a controlled environment. So you can have a recycling program. You can plan things out more. Um, whereas what we tend to do in documentary is we're, we're in the field. And so we get on a plane and off we go with a ragtag group of uh, production professionals. And um, we're going from location to location. And, you know, often it's just the challenge is just getting through the day, trying to make your day and get everything done so that you can travel to the next location um, and unload all your gear and charge everything. And, and, and you repeat that, you know, for 14 days. And then it's like, all of a sudden you're on a plane again. You go, well, what, what just happened? Well, we got the story, but you know, people missed meals. They, you know, we went through all these water bottles. We were charging our batteries in a field in the gas powered production van. Um, you know, for 10 hours straight, you know, so there's a lot of work to be done on that. And that's where we need uh, planning and incentives. And we need sort of a systemic approach. Well, and, uh, yeah. Um, because it, yeah, if, especially if we're doing stories related to the environment, I mean, that makes us big yeah. hypocrites. If, <laughs> if, if we're going out, you know, we're running our vehicles all the time and we're, we're doing something on climate change. Now, Having said that, on this uh, series that we're working on, um, things are going to be different, and that's yeah. part of what we're doing. And I'll defer to uh, Catherine on that because that's hopeful. No, I mean, I think one of the things is, and and I just you know, transparency. I'm I, 
I have a contract at Cream, but when you look at what Cream does as a production company in terms of it, in, in, in terms of trying to to um, to center productions to be sustainable and to be accountable for their footprint, I think that's very important. Um, and I and I haven't seen another production company do that to the extent that Cream does, and also. Um, in a way that is not blamey um, and and scolding people, um, but I think what's you know what's what's interesting is you know what Mark was saying is I think you have to people have to start making some decisions and the thing that I find really interesting is you know there's there's there you can easily charge you can get a solar a, a solar unit to charge your batteries right um, it requires a bit more money and it requires a bit more planning but people for instance who who work in natural history have used them for years right and I think you start to make those decisions and you try and put those decisions in place and and it is for documentary a little easier right there aren't as many people you mm -hmm. can, can you know and and look I'll be honest like I do things and you know on the shows that I'm on I give everybody a water bottle at the beginning of the show and I say that's it that's all if you lose this there will be no water <laughs> um, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not filling the back of the van with bottles of plastic water, right? right. Sorry, that's just, it's not going to happen. And that's a little thing, but if everybody does little things, you know, it yeah. can, it, it, it can, it can help. But I mean, to, just to go back again, like, I think the lack of, I think the, 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 the lack of electric vehicles available for rent is, is, is a huge thing. Yeah. I think also in what we do, the fact that people aren't really looking at what carbon offset is and how to buy proper carbon offset. Um, and because giving five bucks to the airlines, quite frankly, sorry, that doesn't cut it. Um, and really doing some research about what carbon offset um, you can invest in, right? Because it, it, it is an investment, um, I think is really important, especially, you know, I mean, if you fly from, if you fly from London to Copenhagen um, once, the carbon footprint of that is more than the carbon footprint of single people, right? In 15 different countries, one flight, one small inter-European flight. So it's, that's something that people really have to look at. And, and you know, and certainly it's, it's you know, we, we discuss it and there are times where you, where you have to travel and that's it, that's all, but then, then buy a real carbon offset. And do your right. research. I want to go back quickly to um, to Alban and Lucy and get their thoughts on kind of what you've heard about where Toronto is at and where a lot of North American cities are at in terms of not having a lot of charging stations, not having the incentives in place yet. Obviously, Nairobi and Kenya seem to be quite ahead of that, but at some point you were in that situation. So what has that transition looked like? How did Nairobi get from where Toronto is today to where it is now, where you can be having these conversations about, you know, mass transport being transitioned to electric? Um, I think you first have to start out with that Nairobi isn't better than Toronto. So there is no charging infrastructure. Um, and that's why we kind of focus on the products that we do. So we focus on products that are either can be charged out of normal wall outlets, our motorcycles, or are on predefined routes, right? So we install the charging with the products that we deploy. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of the logic between choosing our products and choosing the segments that we go in is that, you know, we stay in a segment that makes sense, in other words. Which is interesting because that's something that could kind of work well in the film industry. You do have, maybe not for a documentary, but if you're going from a production office to set or specific locations, these are sort of predetermined locations that you could, um, you could think about planning those routes. I think Lucy mentioned it as well. A lot of the work that you do is in, in testing the routes and planning the routes and making sure the products can get from point A to point B. And, you know, when you're talking about getting from an office to set or getting from Toronto to Hamilton, where there's a lot of, of the production happening, um, those are already starting to form like logical point A's and point B's that you could think about putting charging at either end. So that's, that's something interesting that we could think about. Um, let's move into, I want to, I want to hear from Mark and Catherine a little bit on, on the series. Um, 
and and what it means to be telling climate stories. Um, and Albin, Lucy, please feel free to jump in if you have other questions or comments to add. Um, although I know that this isn't necessarily um, you know your expertise here, but we, maybe let's start with Mark, and we'll go to a kind of more abstract question, which is what what is the role of a filmmaker or a documentary maker in in telling these climate stories um, in the way that you want to be telling them in this series, but also in the way of, you know, the conversation that we're having, like trying to find logical and practical solutions to things. Is there an overlap here when you're creating a, a climate story? Um, maybe you can just tell us the process of what it means to tell climate stories as a documentary maker. Yeah, sure. Um and just one clarification, the series that we're doing uh, focuses on the environment in general, you know, species loss, climate change, um, the, you know, energy, the, it runs the gamut. We'll travel to all four corners of the globe to tell the stories. I think as a documentary filmmaker, our job is to shine light in dark corners, to bear witness, uh, to tell truth to power, uh, our job necessarily isn't is not necessarily to affect an outcome, but it's to raise awareness, to inform, to educate. And you know, insofar as uh, we're talking about the climate emergency and the climate change, that that's one of the biggest stories since apes uh, started walking upright. So uh, it's incumbent upon us to tell those stories. Um, because it's the biggest story around in many ways. It, it affects, uh, threatens uh, humanity. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the challenge is that there's so much doom and gloom and people tune out, uh, especially younger generations, because it seems hopeless. And so how do we cut through the doom and gloom and all that noise and uh, give people hope? And I think that's what our series is going to be about at, its, at, its, at an elemental level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you how do you do that? And I think one way you do that, just from a storytelling point of view, is you know you don't set it up so that your people think they're being spoon fed something that's good for them. You're, you're telling compelling stories, uh, and you're telling them through people so they can relate to them. And it's not necessarily an environment story with a, a capital E. You know, it's about the air you breathe uh, and the water you drink and about the people in your community and uh, about the things that affect your lives. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we, we can all relate to. Um, and it's not a left issue. It's not a right issue. It's, it's a human issue. Right. Catherine, can you share with us some of the other examples? Mark is talking about hope and... Um, taking this more inspirational approach to how we can turn things around. Rome is a great example of one of the companies that will be in the series, you know, a, a company that's doing things right. They're doing things uh, sustainably, ethically. They're, you know, leapfrogging over solutions that are no longer serving us. Can you give us a little bit more, um, maybe a sneak peek of what, you know, some of the other projects will be on the series or how they all fit into this idea of hope? Sure. I, I would also say that if, if you have a look at Rome's motorcycles, they're really cool too. Like they're <laughs> just really good looking. Um, uh, I mean, I think that the, what's interesting about this series is, is um, we look at, you know, we look at, we're going to look at governments, we're going to look at countries, we're going to look at individuals, we're going to look at big companies um, and small companies. Um, and I think, you know, a really interesting example is Uruguay. So Uruguay decided, um, a little while ago that that they wanted to be energy independent um, and and they decided that they needed that they needed re renewable sources of electricity and they have for the most part accomplished that um, and it's kind of amazing and they've done it they've they've done it in less than 20 years um, and it it doesn't occur to most people in 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 the global north that 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 uruguay would be doing something like that and it puts a lot of other a lot of other countries and jurisdictions to jurisdictions shame because it shows that you can do it. If you simply want to do it, you can do it. And I think it's, you know, there are, and Kenya is obviously a much bigger country. 
Um, but if you look at, as Lucy was saying, the amount of, of, of electricity, which is renewable in Kenya and the fact that they've got, they have an excess of electricity at night. Um, uh, I think that when people hear stories about what government can do, they'll then, they, they then realize that all they need to do is put pressure on their own government, right? To change, to change infrastructure and things that are, and, and things that are seemingly out of their control, but they actually Actually do have control. If you if if you can vote, then you have control. Um, I think there are also a lot of really other. There, there's another story that we're doing in Kenya, um, which is an NGO called Ocean Soul, um, and it's a really beautiful group of people. They make art out of flip flops, so they collect um, flip flops on the beach at Kalifi, um, and those are pressed into blocks and then they're carved, um, and it's fantastic because it's making art out of garbage. Um, what, and what's also interesting, though, is, is, is they've looked at, um, Ocean Soul has looked at where those flip-flops are coming from, and they're not, uh, for the most part, um, some of them are certainly Kenyan, but, but for the most part, they're not. They're, they're, they're coming in on, um, on currents from Southeast Asia. Um, and, I you know, and I think when you see that and you have an understanding of what happens to your garbage, um, and where your garbage goes. And certainly Canadians, we saw that um, when we were dumping our garbage in, uh, in the Philippines. Um, uh, but I think it's, it's important for people to, to, to see stories like that so that they know that, they can, that they, if they change their own behavior, right, the world will change. Mm -hmm. It's certainly if they change their government, their country will change. And I think those are, are all really interesting things to talk about and look at. Mm -hmm. Mark, I'm curious, you mentioned before that you started your career um, in the environmental unit at CNN. And so you've been talking about the environment for a long time. Has the way we tell the story changed? What's changed or what hasn't changed about how we talk about climate and, and environmental related issues? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how to answer that exactly, but it has changed. Um, you know, maybe one way it's changed is that the environment is now part of uh, more stories, not all stories, but there's an environmental angle to every story that comes up. And, you know, we used to sort of fight to get stories related to the environment on the news. I was the, uh, I was the um, national environment reporter for Canadian television after I came back from CNN. And, you know, just like any other reporter, you're trying to get your, what you think is the best story on the news and you're, you know, you're up against, you know, stories, you know, coming out of the Middle East and Washington and on and on and everything else. And you have to find a way to tell compelling stories. I think it's easier to tell those stories now because people um, realize that they're important stories and they play out in our daily lives, whether it's, you know, hurricane season. Uh, or, you know, forest fires, uh, flooding, uh, you know, the catastrophic events or just government policy and everything else. I think um, the environment is, is sort of the background to a lot of stories. You know, I, I did a documentary recently on the lost colony of Roanoke, which was this colony that was set up uh, in the 16th century before the Mayflower and everything else in the United States and it went missing. And uh, the story was about uh, this archaeological dig to on the Outer Banks of North Carolina to understand what happened to these people. And it's a really interesting story. And there's science involved and evidence. But the background to that story is that hurricanes, rising sea levels, uh, and you know the greater frequency of storms is washing away the evidence that uh, threatens the, the foundation myth of the United States, you know, the first Europeans that settled there. So it's not what the plot is about, but it certainly affects the theme. Mm -hmm. And I see that regularly happening. Uh, so, you know, is, that's not an environment story, is it? Uh, but the environment is part of that. So I think it's mm -hmm. just being aware uh, and recognizing um, how to integrate uh, that into the story but it's it's naturally there anyways mm -hmm. uh, so that's one way it's changed um yeah, i don't know if that answers your question yeah i mean it's just you know you said we've been talking about this for for decades yeah. and it's curious to me how how that's changed right. what progress we've made along the way where we haven't made progress 
Um, and yeah, and I think one one challenge uh, regarding climate change is you know that's a slow moving story that's taking place globally, and you know even though we're we're talking about the Earth's uh, global temperature increasing over time and that playing out in rising sea levels and volatility of weather and everything else, that's a slow moving story. It's the biggest story around, but how do you tell that? How do you animate that? Mm -hmm. And again, I think, you know, the solution is to tell it through people and how it affects them. And, you know, that's not uh, a revolutionary approach. That's just story time. So, you know, environment stories are stories. They're important stories. It just takes people to come along and sort of uh, to push for them, to advocate, advocate for them. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, it used to be in a, in a small compartment. Here's an environment story, and here's the environment reporter telling the story, or here's a story about the climate. Now it's, it's part of everything. Mm -hmm. so. And Lucy gave uh, an example earlier of um, the importance of telling the story of maybe what a lithium battery is to somebody that doesn't know what that means and doesn't know the impacts of that. Do you, I'm going to put the question out to everybody. Are there, um, are there ways that you on an individual level can see these sort of one-on-one -on -one interactions? How do you encourage a sustainable lifestyle at the individual level, whether that's in the work that you're doing or in your personal life? Um, and, and how can you sort of help your, your friends, your family, your network, your communities foster a more sustainable lifestyle? Uh, maybe we can start with Lucy. You gave us that example before and then move to Alvin. Yeah, um, I'd say it's about getting down to the to, to their level. Um, so I was privileged to be part of a show um, that was teaching children um, about the age of, you know, eight years, nine years about what um, green fuel is. And you can imagine teaching a child what an electric vehicle is, is not an easy thing. So you have to get down to their level <laughs> and make them, it was quite, and I, and I love that, that we're starting to teach these um, stories or these issues to children so that they grow up understanding what this is. Um, so sort of a cultural shift that is slowly being um, inculcated in their young minds so that they grow knowing that they need to take care of the environment and things like that. Um, but that's just a different a different thing I wanted to point out that it's it's important to target children as well um, and tell stories in a way that everyone understands. Sometimes you read climate reports and even as a technical person, it's heavy to read. It's so heavy to read. It's like, parts per million of carbon and etc etc it's a lot of very heavy data that a normal lay person does not really care about or understand so it's just a matter of telling the story in a way that people understand if i'm sitting with my family if they ask me what i do on a daily basis i can't tell them oh i research on cell chemistries that um, allow for faster charging and you know <laughs> They don't, they don't understand what that means. But if I tell them I build motorbikes that are cleaner, they are quiet, so we get fresher air. So then that means that, you know, um, our climate is going to be better or we are going to have a greener environment or a greener planet. It's a bit more interesting for them in that sense. So it's always about the why. I think that's how I'd see it. It's always about the why and then framing the why in a way that the particular target audience relates to and understands. If I'm speaking to, uh, so for example, a, a taxi rider, a taxi driver, um, I, would, I would approach it in, in the sense that this, this has an economic advantage to you because this is their livelihood and telling them that, you know, this product is going to save you money makes them interested then you can talk more about it so it's engaging them grabbing attention mm -hmm. by starting from what they understand so if i'm talking to a mother for example i'll tell her this um 
air right now is very polluted. It's very, um, I think it's it's unsafe for, for a young child to grow in an environment where the air is so heavily polluted and most children are getting respiratory diseases because of this. That grabs the attention of the mother and then they start figuring out, okay, how do we make this air better for our children? Um, and then you can start explaining the technology and the science behind all of that. But it's, um, I think it's just, we start by grabbing the attention of the person. And I think as Rome, we've done that quite well by packaging our products in a way that is familiar. Mm -hmm. So our, our, I think our motorcycles, if you look at it at a glance, it, it doesn't look futuristic or out of this world. <laughs> it's not, oh my gosh, what is this? So it's a familiar product that people relate with and mm -hmm. that grabs their attention. They're like, what is this thing that is affordable, but yet quiet? And then now you can start talking to them about all the benefits, the environmental benefits that it has. Um, so for me, it's always about grabbing the attention of the target audience. And I think people in the, in the film or storytelling industry should, I think, use that approach or could use that approach um, trying to grab the attention of the people by telling stories that are relatable to them mm -hmm. and then slowly grabbing the attention getting them interested in the conversation yeah so that they feel like this is for them and not just something the un should care about um you know not my problem right um so it, yeah you have to understand make them feel like they're part of the solution in one way or the other yeah. i think that would make two sense yeah yeah, and then I think additionally on that, it's about, uh, you know, not trying to compromise on um, the way, uh, you know, someone operates their life today. I mean, if you can make it more cost effective, you can make it a better experience, a cooler experience, something that I feel attached to rather than something I have to give up. You know, I think it's never on the consumer to uh, really have to make like sustainable choices, but they should be given opportunities to make sustainable choices from, you know, governments, corporations and things like that, mm -hmm. rather than having to bear that weight themselves. Yeah. Mark, is there a way that you're um, bringing the sustainable lifestyle to your network? I mean, other than of course, through documentary uh, filmmaking. Um. Well, one thing I'm, I'm involved in somebody's uh, PhD uh, in that I'm on their, I'm a PhD committee member uh, for someone I know in the industry who I've worked with for years who came up through the ranks as a production assistant, a camera assistant, and then a, as a production coordinator and is now doing their, their PhD and trying to figure out um, how documentary can be used to impact uh, social change and, then, and how that can be measured uh, mm -hmm. and the documentary that they're doing is not necessarily related to the environment um, but that could be used as a tool to sort of uh, provide a bigger picture in terms of the importance of what we're doing and and keeping us accountable mm -hmm. again i'm not i'm not necessarily certain that it's our job to uh, to affect change. It's to raise awareness and to inform mm -hmm. uh, and to put it out there in the world. Um, in our own lives, it, we certainly have that responsibility um, as people, as as parents, and as members of the community, as neighbors. We have the responsibility. Um, you know, so that's that's one thing I can think of. Mm -hmm. What I'm liking about the conversation is that the storytelling, as we've discussed it today, has really spanned from the one on one at the dinner table, you know, explaining what a lith lithium battery is kind of storytelling all the way up to sort of this high level, broad documentary storytelling and even, um, you know, these government level stories and that the storytelling takes place at every level. And maybe that's actually something, and Catherine, maybe you can have the last word here, but that's where the series fits really nicely, where you have this sort of high level approach to talking about these issues, but you're also bringing in these really 
grassroots on the ground projects that are doing this at that micro level. So maybe you can end us off um, today with a comment on, you know, the series and how it's taking that kind of middle approach. Sure, I think that I, I think that what the series is striving to do is, is, and Mark mentioned it earlier that there's just so much bad news about sustainability and about climate um, and everything else that there are very few positive stories and 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 without being Pollyanna-ish, I think there is there's an extraordinary amount of innovation going on in the world. There there's there there are people who are trying to make. Um, better decisions for the planet, everywhere from a dining room table, right, to, to governments. And, and, and we're just we're just trying to, to, to tell those stories and, and give people some hope and say, there are things you can do. There are little things you can do. There are medium things there that you can do. And there are big things you can do. Um, and I, you know, I think, um, I think that's important, but I also, it's, it's, it's also a lovely journey to be on. Right. It's it's, you know, at least once a day, I'll turn to one of my colleagues and go, you have, look at how cool this is. Look at these people. Um, and I and I think that's great. And I think we're, we're privileged to be able to, to tell those stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So we're going to come up to our time here. Um, I want to open the floor for any last thoughts or comments from everyone, um, whether it's on electric vehicles or the future of of telling climate stories or, or something else that you didn't have a chance to say? Uh, something I've been thinking about is, I wish it wasn't a competition between fossil versus electric. I wish it was a competition between good versus evil. Like our planet, it's, it's cause you see like the sensational, sensational media makes, makes it such that we are pinning the products against each other. It's like, oh, these electric vehicles are here, but um, what is the performance? Is it better than the fossil fuel? Um, what about range anxiety? What about this, 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 and that? And sometimes it's a lot of negativity that makes it very difficult to penetrate the market when we are, we are you know, inducing so much anxiety and lack of trust in the, you know, the, the processes and the steps that we are making, slow but sure steps. Um, so yeah, I was, I was in one conference um, some time back and we were pitching our products uh, at the time. Um, that was our first pilot of the motorbikes. And someone came up to us and was like, uh, what about the circular economy of the battery? The, the, you know, that is something that is going to become a problem and I don't see where this is headed and all of that. And, you know, our response was, we're making small steps and a lot of research will definitely come into play. We are definitely thinking about circular economy, how to design better, uh, more eco-friendly vehicles and things like that. But we need to appreciate the steps being taken. So I, I guess it's a call to production companies and storytellers to focus on the positives of the steps that are being made, um, other than making it a competition between fossil versus electric vehicles. Let's just all look at the future of the planet um, as a whole. Mm -hmm. And have even, you know, people in the fossil vehicle industry coming together, you know, joining forces with us to just make products better and more eco-friendly. We all just need to work together to make things better um, at the end of the day. And the future is electric. Um, so. That's a good final plug. The future is electric. <laughs> Alvin, any last thoughts? I think it's, you know, you got to try to make a change and, you know, there is no option but hope really to, to, um, to move forward. And, uh, you know, every effort is the best effort as long as it's not working against, you know, the way we try to live and the way we try to operate. Um, so I think it's, you know, you got to continue striving and continue moving forward. Mm -hmm. Mark, any final thoughts on that? Yeah, just simply that there's so many great things happening out there, technology-wise, people-wise, movement-wise, and there's hope. And uh, we just need the will to do it. Yeah. And some of these inspiring examples Catherine's talked about and that we'll be sharing uh, 
sharing on the series later on. I think I'm really excited to see those. I think they'll give people hope. They'll show they'll show people that we're there are you know smart minds coming together to work on solutions. We are smart uh, individuals. Humanity is a smart species. We're inventive. We're innovative, and we can you know come up with these solutions to the problems that we've created. Um, so I think, uh, I think that's a nice place to leave it off. I wanna thank everyone for your time today, for your insights. Lucy and Albin, thank you so much for joining us from Kenya and for sharing with us the exciting work of Rome and the progress you're making. And we're, we're definitely following along to see how that goes. And Catherine and Mark, thank you for sharing um, with us the responsibility of filmmaking and telling these stories and um, making sure that these stories also include hope and not just the doom and gloom. Wow, so thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.